how many of you in the audience are wearing something that's made of gold? Hands up. Come on, there must be nearly everybody in the audience. How many of you have bought something that's made of gold? And how many of you um, have bought something that's made of gold and given it to someone else? <laughs> and, and for most of you, I'm guessing, gold has a little bit of a special allure. And it does for the world at large. And uh, it's one of the reasons why gold is, uh, has its sort of a place in its own right when it comes to the minerals industry. Applications? Well, it's still 40% of gold is, is used in monetary exchange and investment. And I'll provide a few more details of this shortly. 50% is in jewellery. And only 10% of gold's usage is in is other applications. So medicine, food and drinks solders, embroidery, reflective coatings, electronics. So 90% uh, really is being used in either monetary purposes or investment purposes and, and jewellery applications. And you can see some of the typical usages. The, the really interesting picture from my point of view is the bottom right, which is uh, a telescope and it's been, ref it's been lined with gold for uh, reflectance purposes because of its very particular electronic properties. Gold in its purest form is a, is a reddy yellow colour. As soon as you start adding silver, it gets, turns into an even brighter um, yellow colour, then becomes paler and turns into white. So the white gold that you see is, is a combination of gold and silver. The red gold that you see is a combination of gold and copper. And so a lot of people really look to those subtle um, blends to generate different colours and, and different uh, properties. At the present time, about 60% of gold that's, that's being put into the market is coming from production from mine sites. And approximately 40% is being recycled. And that's a really interesting number for me. I don't know where this 40% comes from because 90% of the production is going into jewellery and um, monetary and, and investment purposes. Yet if we're producing 40%, I think that's a lot of recycled jewellery and I imagine that that's coming from all of those uh, dissolved marriages that are happening in Western society these days. <laughs> but I don't know how long that can last because you know, most of the gold is staying as gold in the market as, as above ground. It's not really being consumed as such as, as in a lot of other commodities. And for many countries, gold is a very major source of income and wealth for them. Um, this is the top 15 gold producing countries in, in the world in 2012. You can see that China is way up, way up, up the top in terms of uh, the gross value added. And you can see there that it's looking around 12, 13 billion dollars. Um, then there's a, a pretty significant drop down to four countries and then you go progressively down. The really interesting statistic there is those yellow dots is, is the proportion of that gross value added as a percentage of the country's GDP. And for many of the big players, you can see there China, United States, Russia, Australia, the, the actual proportion of uh, gross value added as part of their GDP is really relatively small. But for a number of the countries, it's, it's a really major contributor to the country's wealth. And you look at the PNG there where it's up at 14%. Um, you know, they, they depend on their gold production for, for sustaining their economy. Uh, and other countries there where it's up at uh, sort of 4 or 5%. So for many countries, this is a, a really major industry for them. In terms of uh, gold <coughs> demand, let's look at some of the major uses for gold. You can see here that here's some statistics for 2010, 11 and 12. Um, and you can see where jewellery is in terms of the consumption of jewellery. It's uh, nominally about 50%. It's a bit less in 2012 um, because if you look at the very bottom line there before the the totals, you see the central bank net purchases. There's a, a fairly significant increase in the central uh, bank purchases in 2011-2012. So that sort of reduced the, the consumption of jewellery, or it's uh, it's made it less than 50 percent. But uh, you can see jewellery there. Um, then then in, in industrial and dental type requirements, it's uh, you know significantly less. Um, and as I said, those industrial and uh, applications are really only about 10% of the uh, gold production in terms of each year. And uh, another big category there, investment. So total bar and coin demand is uh, you know, 1,200 tonnes or thereabouts every year made up of physical bars plus official coins and other medallions and, and, uh, and imitation coins. 
So it gives you a, a bit of an idea of, of where the gold that's being produced is, is, is in use. If you look at where the gold is going, you can see there that China and India just dominate. Um, in terms of the left-hand side of the plot there, you're looking at seven, 800 tonnes per year of gold is going into China and, uh, and India, and then there's a huge jump. It's almost those two and the rest of the world. Um, interesting, there, there are some pretty interesting trends there in terms of uh, who some of the big players are, um, and there's some of the countries that you may not necessarily expect, but they're all dwarfed by China and India. Um, the demand for gold going forward, given the China, India, um, Southeast Asia, very, very strong. Um, and, and Europe, of course, has been a traditional um, gold buyer. And, and all this is considering that China, for example, some of these, this data, is, it's, that was just consumers and retailers. We don't even take into fact that the central government of China, when you compare that to other central governments, they're actually way behind in terms of how much gold deposits they have. So if China central government starts to buy up, I think the price will be quite buoyant uh, going forward. When you now look at the jewellery demand by country, it's, it's also China and India, and uh, the two big areas of, of demand in terms of those areas. But again, there's some pretty significant uh, places there as well. You've got uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey, um, Russia, USA up there with, uh, with reasonable numbers, but, but certainly big demand coming out of China and, and, and India for jewellery. Touch on, on the, one of the special attributes, I suppose, of gold is if you, if you look at um, the total above ground stocks of gold, you can see that we're dealing with an estimate of about 168,000 tonnes of gold <coughs> is somewhere on the Earth's surface now. Um, and if you go back a couple of slides, you'll see that annual production is around 2,500 tonnes. Uh, and we're now currently sitting at a, around about 170,000 tonnes. 85,000 tonnes is tied up in jewellery. 31,000 tonnes is tied up with uh, people's private investments under their beds. We've got the uh, central banks who are holding less than what the private uh, individuals are, are holding. Um, other fabrication is 20,000 tonnes and, and in the terms of the, the people that put together this statistic, we've got 3,600 tonnes unaccounted for. I'm guessing some of those are being held by people in the room. Um, I'm sure that uh, you know, there's a little bit of gold in Singapore that's probably unaccounted for. But uh, it shows you that uh, it's one of the other interesting things that we deal with and makes gold a little bit different compared to some of the other commodities. So in terms of the central banks, this is the top 40 countries and their official gold holdings. And you can see there the level of gold that's being held by those top 40 countries. And, and predictably, United States, uh, Germany are at the top. The United States clearly out in the front. Um, Singapore is there. And uh, Singapore has a significant uh, stockpile of gold. Even poor countries like Australia have a little bit of gold in, in uh, their central banks. Um, and I think Singapore, there are 127 tonnes of gold being stored as part of your central bank's uh, holdings. Just to touch on why gold is a little bit different and, and to re-emphasise gold versus some of the other um, commodities, this is a plot which shows the demand and supply and it splits it into the demand for jewellery, the demand for investment, and the demand for industry or technology applications, and where the supply is coming from. And if you look there at the top, you can see jewelries, um, you know, approximately 50%, investment 40%, and technology is 10%. And the production is split between 60% mine production and 40% recycling. And that's really quite different to things like silver, copper, and platinum. And you can see there that that uh, the statistics for copper are very, very different. So we've really got different drivers for gold, for the gold market, and just that slide just helps to reinforce that. This is the monthly spot price for the last 30 years, um, and I've been in the industry for over 30 years, so I, I've seen the gold prices down at $250. So there's times when we're sitting at $1,300 and, and everyone's whinging about the gold price, and I'm sort of not that sympathetic sometimes because um, less than 10 years ago we were sitting at $300 an ounce. But you can see the major growth in that last 10 year period and uh, 
for the previous 20 years, you know, basically the gold price was generally under $500 an ounce. But it, it, has its, it has its moments, and there's been spikes before that as well. But you know, we can see there also a very intense high over the last two years, up at $1,700 or thereabouts. If you narrow that down to the last five years, you can see the, the, uh, the end of the, the peak period, um, where it hit the, the, the peaks of $1,750, $1,800, and you see the last uh, year. And uh, certainly for many people that uh, entered the industry uh, two to three years ago, then they are really struggling now that the price has come off $400.